Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is lesson number three in the new series on Ezra and Nehemiah. This is the lesson for October 19 of 2019, entitled, God's Call. Hmm, wonder what that could mean. Well, we'll find out as we study together, but as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we look at these materials written by your friends so long ago, we're amazed at the preci precision of the prophecies, the details of uh, the events and the datings. Uh, help us to understand how you clearly can predict the future, know in advance of what's going to happen, and predict it for our benefit when that's appropriate. Be with us as we study these things that we may come to respect you and honor you greater and more is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So what does it mean to be called by God? Any of you feel like you're called by God? I hope every day. Yeah. I mean, we we're all called to be God's people and to be saved by him. That would be his ideal. Um, does, he call to a, does he call us to a specific task? That's a more challenging question. Obviously, there are people who... Sometimes. Yeah, there are people who make a great show of the fact, I was called to do this and this and this. Maybe we don't quite feel like we're like that. Yes, Gordon? In the church colloquial, we say that we... A minister, a person is called to be a minister of a mm -hmm. specific congregation. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the call. So, how does God go about choosing whom to call? We'll have to ask that's him up, someday, yeah, I that's guess. That's up to him. And how more a more important question for us is: How are we supposed to know if God has called us? The question we, is for which task? Yeah, well, that's saved or it's another part of the question. Well, of course, in this lesson, we'll focus primarily on Ezra and what God asked him to do and how he was called, and in turn, Nehemiah, what happened with him. Each was called to a specific but quite different task, but both of their skills were needed in order to accomplish what needed to be accomplished. The children of Israel needed to be called back to God to be redirect to redirect their lives to, and live, to serving him and then God would help them to rebuild their city. Um, sometimes when reading these Old Testament passages does it seem like God is kind of picky? If you don't do this, I won't do that. Does it ever seem like that to you? Well, they yes. have to have, a, in order to make a choice, they have to have a clear mm -hmm. delineation of uh, blessings and cursings, which is what you're referring to there. Yeah. But he also knew those people. Yes. Yeah. Well, try to imagine what might have happened if either Ezra or Nehemiah had not been able to do the tasks which God gave them to do. Would the southern kingdom of Judah have faded into history just like the northern kingdom did? We'd never even heard about them. Would the Bible have disappeared? We would never have heard of such a thing. So I have a corollary question. Maybe God called the northern kingdom to come back also, and someone didn't do their job. Mm -hmm. Very possible. Mm -hmm. I suspect that God has w tried to work through most nations of this earth through history, mm -hmm. and most have just rejected him. Yeah. So well, what... Were, uh, what? The northern kingdom were dispersed somewhat, yeah. but uh, that whole area was then taken over by Babylon and then Medo-Persia. And so <laughs> when, when the call to come back, there may have been some, for, for, for instance, Anna the prophetess yeah. in Jesus' day was of the tribe of Asher, I think. Uh, yeah. How no, could she still be considered the tribe of Asher if they intermarried yeah. or... Clearly when the call was given by all three of these people that we've talked about in the last couple of lessons and now in this lesson, any Jew, any, well, let's not, be, let's not just limit them to Jews because Jews would, be, would, Jews would be descendants of Judah, but any Israelite who wanted to return could do so, and some did. 
even of the ten tribes, and so forth. So, um, I was thinking also that when the first call went out to return to Judea and Jerusalem, Ezra didn't go. Nehemiah no. didn't go. Their parents didn't go. Some no. good people didn't go. Yep. Daniel didn't go. Of course, he was pretty old, and yeah. and he probably felt, like felt he, that he was doing what God wanted him to do at that point. Yeah, well, clearly, both Ezra and Nehemiah had leadership skills. Ezra was a skilled teacher. Um, he had, clearly, he was committed to understanding the scriptures and explaining the scriptures and copying the scriptures. It was, Ezra was the first one to put together something like what we would call the Old Testament. The first one. Now remember, he collects all the writings. He collects all the writings and brings them. He says, do you, he went around. Do you have some? Do you have some? Do you have some? Do you, you know, please let me borrow them. I'll, I'll, I'll give them back to you. But right now I want to copy and make sure that we have as, as full a, a list of all the materials that are available as, as possible. Yeah, that's exactly what he did. Well, what do we know about Ezra's work before he was called to do what he did? But we know his ancestors. Know. Yeah. We know the names of his ancestors, and that is all. We have no idea what his job was. We know that he was a descendant of the priests. But what would a priest do in in Babylon or or in in Persia, for that matter? I mean, they were not clearly not supported by ties at that point. So we don't know. We just don't know what he did before that. Did they set up synagogues or something like that while they were in Babylon where they got together okay. to worship? Uh, the answer to that technically is no because the very first actual synagogues didn't happen until about 200 B.C. They decided the time had come for us to... And they made a ruling that any town or city that had at least 10 Jewish families had to have a place where they could meet together, a synagogue, and that was primarily for the purpose of educating the boys. So before that, we have no evidence there were any synagogues. Now, there were, clearly there are places to worship. There was a temple in Jerusalem, and there were there's these 48 villages that were set aside that were supposed to be the Levite villages uh, and, and centers where they were supposed to be leading out in the worship of the Lord and so forth if you want to call those synagogues, but probably well, nothing... I, I was thinking about yeah, them gathering building. together in Babylon. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure they gathered together. Yeah. Some of them, I'm sure, gathered together. How would you like to be in the study group with Daniel as the mm. leader? Or Ezra, for that matter. Thinking or, about those 48 cities where you had Levite centers spread out over both the northern and the southern. This was That's happening correct. before the Assyrians dispersed. Exactly. And there still has to be faithful believers. Maybe when they got div dispersed, some of them fled to Jerusalem, the south. If you re yeah, and many of them did, especially the Levites. Many of them fled to the south. Of course, you remember the story of the Levite and the concubine from the end of Judges, and so they weren't all super faithful followers of God. <laughs> anyway. I always think of the false prophet. Yeah, yeah. And to the other guy that was a prophet. Somehow or other, even though we have no idea what Ezra was doing or why, somehow or other he had some kind of a close relationship with the emperor. You know, not many people were able to get close to the emperor because he was able to get permission for what he... Yeah. Any indication that Ezra and Nehemiah knew each other in Susa? Before they got to Jerusalem? I couldn't we, find anything. No, we, there's no indication anywhere of that. Uh, the interesting question in my mind is they both must have known about Esther. I mean, both of them both of them would have been old enough so that if Esther had failed to do what she did, they would both have been killed. Mm -hmm. So they both must have known about Esther. Whether they knew each other, we don't know. That's about 483, I think, Esther's time. Yeah. And, and 457, see, that's what, 16 years later, Ezra's leading off and Another 13 years later, Nehemiah's off. So, And certainly they would have known about da about Daniel. I mean, yes, yeah. They would have known about Mordecai. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they they maybe Daniel because Pershing. of Mordecai, they also had jobs with in the palace. Exactly. It's so hundred years later. It's very possible that Mordecai was the one who got both of them jobs mm -hmm. in, in the in the palace. Well, somehow or other got Ezra got permission, then later we know we'll talk about what Nehemiah did. Um so what do you think Ezra did during those first 13 years he was back in Jerusalem? Again, teaching the people. He was teaching we people. Over he the, was collecting scriptures and so forth, that kind of stuff. Right, I we guess skipped we, over that particular verse. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and read that to us? Yeah, Ezra 7.10. Ezra had devoted his life to studying the law of the Lord, to practicing it, and to teaching all its laws and regulations to the people of Israel. Uh, and that's the Good News Translation. Very good. Okay. So that gives us a hint. And we, we have uh, from other sources we recognize that one of the things he did was pull together the scriptures and probably train people to make copies. So those are some of the things. Um, so we yeah. certainly know later that people memorize large portions of scripture. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Ezra, do we have any reason to think that Ezra went to people and said, what do you remember from the scripture? Or from, from the writings of Moses or from the writings of the judges and so on. Yeah, that formalization of memorization became really prominent with the, with the later development of the synagogues. And so we just don't. I mean, we don't know what they taught in the in the schools of the prophets, from from Samuel's day to Elijah and Elisha's day, and so forth. There's a lot of things we don't know. What we do know is that Ezra is recognized as the first of the scribes. Now, we who tended to focus more on the New Testament, we have sort of a negative attitude toward the scribes. But without the scribes, we wouldn't have our scriptures. So Ezra is the one who set up that idea. And then there's Nehemiah. What do we know about Nehemiah? The wine taster. He was a wine taster. And why was he tasting wine? Make sure the man didn't get poisoned. Make sure the emperor didn't get poisoned. Now, uh, how would you get chosen for that kind of a job? That could be a very risky job. But you would want to choose somebody that you could very much trust. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's an important point. So mm -hmm. Nehemiah apparently was very trustworthy. The emperor regarded him as very trustworthy. And that's a good thing. But then the next question comes, um, if you were God, um, would, you put, would you choose a wine taster as the next <laughs> leader of your people? Um, hmm. Well, we do know a couple of other things about Nehemiah. What happened when he found out the bad news about what was happening in Jerusalem? Fasted and prayed. And he fasted and, and prayed and wept for the thing, people in Jerusalem for four months waiting for his opportunity to say something. Okay, next question. Do you think Ezra and Nehemiah would have chosen their jobs that they ended up with for themselves? Did they like those ideas or... What do you think? They didn't seem to resist in no. the same way that, say, Jonah, for mm -hmm. instance, yeah. uh, did. Uh, they were more like Isaiah, hear my, send me kind of thing. Okay. Um, does God choose people to do things they really like to do? Sometimes. Or does he sometimes I choose... Sometimes. <laughs> he probably does quite often. Uh-huh. Just speculation. But. Yeah. Well, sometimes God chooses people to do things that seem almost impossible. So I'm sure Moses thought that what he was being chosen for was impossible. Well, so Ezra was a student of Scripture, a very good student of Scripture, and did a wonderful work. What does it take to get a person excited about studying the gospel and, the, and then sharing it with others? Do we have a magic way of inspiring people about the gospel? Well, the Holy Spirit has a part in that too. Oh, well, really? <laughs> yeah. We have to be Works inspired ourselves. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and do you think God arranged for Ezra and Nehemiah each to have a special relationship with the emperor, most powerful person in the world at that time? So they could... I think so. He sets yeah. up kings and he takes down kings. Yeah. Or did he choose them because they were there? Which is another possibility. But uh, yes. did they get there by accident or did God help them to get there? That's the question. Well, that decree that Artaxerxes issued to Ezra in the year 457 would probably not really matter at all except for what? Except for Daniel 9. Daniel's prophecy that had been written decades earlier. And so all of a sudden, this becomes very important in trying to determine how to, I mean, to, to, how to interpret Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Let me just read those words. From, um, I'm going to read it from one of the more traditional translations. Uh, just to get a few because it, it's technically... I can get there. We go. Get it by this test. Is Daniel nine, starting with verse twenty, twenty-four. We're going to call Daniel nine. Start with twenty-four. Seventy weeks are decreed for your people and your holy city. Now, if you remember Daniel nine, he was prob- he was praying God earnestly for what? What kind of information did he want to know? When will the 70-year prophecy by Jeremiah come to an end? It's about time, God. When are you going to take us back to Jerusalem? And all of a sudden, he gets this information. Seventy weeks are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression. Notice these things. Finish the transgression. Put an end to sin. Wow. And to atone for iniquity to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. There's three things that the people needed to do or would affect them directly, and three things which are probably more in God's department. 25. Know therefore and understand from the time that the word went out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the time of an anointed prince, there should be seven weeks. What does anointed prince mean? What's another word for anointed prince? Messiah. Messiah Messiah. or Christ. Christ is the Greek. Messiah is the Hebrew. That means someone who's anointed. There shall be seven weeks, and for 62 weeks it shall be built again with streets and moat, but in a troubled time. After the 62 weeks, an anointed one, again, Messiah or Christ, shall be cut off and shall have nothing, and the troops of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolation. Um, hold on here. Lost my place. Desolations are decreed. He shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall make sacrifice and offering cease, and in their place shall be an abomination that desolates until the decreed end is poured out upon the desolator. Wow. So it should probably be said that this is the words of Gabriel, <coughs> the, the covering cherub, uh, explaining part of Daniel 8 to, yeah. to Daniel. Yes. Well, well, we'll get a little bit more information about that in a moment. Now, Seventh-day Adventists have sometimes almost suggested that this prophecy in Daniel 9, 24-27 Linking to the earlier prophecy of Daniel 8.14, which was discovered and first interpreted by William Miller, was almost a specific message for us and our church. Have you ever gotten that impression? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Have you been listening to any Daniel sermons recently? Bible or doctrines. Reading any books or read, yeah. took a class on Bible doctrines, absolutely. But we are not the first ones to have recognized the correct interpretation of those passages pointing down to the correct arrival time of the Messiah. The Jewish leaders at the time of the birth of Jesus knew where he was going to be born. Remember the Micah 5.2, mm-hmm. Bethlehem, Ephrathah, and so forth. They also knew that it was about the right time for the Messiah to come. Many years later, some of the Jewish leaders, recognizing that Daniel had prophesied correctly 
the time of the Messiah's arrival and not wanting to admit that they had rejected the Messiah, wrote the following rabbinic curse. Jackie? May the bones of the hands and the bones of the fingers decay and decompose of him who turns the pages of the book of Daniel to find out the time of Daniel 9, 24 to 27. And may his memory rot from off the face of the earth forever. Wow. Talmudic Law, page 978, section 2, line 28. When, <laughs> when would that have been written? Probably two or three hundred years after Christ. Now, did they have verses and uh, chapters? No, no. I'm sure the verses and chapters were added later. Just like our, our verses, our first chapters were first added to the Bible in around 1200 A.D. Right. And then verses were added in 1551. So this was revised. This wasn't... When well, they wrote this in 200 A.D., they didn't write Daniel 9, 24 to 27. No, no, they, no, no, no. This was um, fleshed out, yeah. so to speak, later yeah, on. Right. Redaction. Redaction. <laughs> so sometimes after the days of Jesus, it seems clear that the Jewish leaders were quite convinced that he was the true Messiah. And what evidence do we have for that in the scripture itself? I, we've talked about this several times in the past. Look at Acts 6 verse 7. And so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger and a great number of priests accepted the faith. So it wasn't everybody who rejected there was a lot of them who accepted. And what about the Pharisees even? Acts 15, verse 5. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. So they thought that uh, Christians should be a subset of um, Phariseeism, obviously. Well... The Jews didn't, clearly didn't want to admit that they might have missed the coming of the Messiah and so forth. And so they made the curse. Well, the Bible describes three decrees, just to review, given for the restoration of the Jewish people in Jerusalem and the rest of Judea and the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. Cyrus, Darius or Darius, and Artaxerxes all gave different commands for accomplishing that task. Cyrus gave the first command, allowing the Jews to return home. And at that time, they actually built an altar and began to sacrifice. There was no temple yet, but they had an altar. Darius, or Darius, gave an additional command, allowing them to complete the rebuilding of the temple. That happened between 16 and 20 years after the first command. Uh, but only Artaxerxes gave a command which allowed for the rebuilding of the city wall of Jerusalem itself, and that decree is associated with praising God for his intervention. And Margaret, I think you have some words, <coughs> verses is, on that. This is from Ezra seven seventeen to 18 and 27 to 28. You are to spend this money carefully and buy bulls, rams, lambs, corn, and wine and offer them on the altar of the temple in Jerusalem. You may use the silver and gold that is left over for whatever you and your people desire in accordance with the will of your God. Ezra said, Praise the Lord, the God of our ancestors. He has made the emperor willing to honor in this way the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. By God's grace, I have won the favor of the emperor, of his counselors, and of all his powerful officials. The Lord my God has given me courage, and I have been able to persuade many of the heads of the clans of Israel to return with me. Wow. This is from the Good News Bible. That decree was a fulfillment of the criteria <coughs> set out in Daniel's prophecy. And what are those, what, what are those words, Jim? That's Daniel 8. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one that spoke, for how long is this vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and hosts to be trampled? And he answered him for 2,300 evenings and mornings. Then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. 
The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true. As for you, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. So I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I arose and went about the king's business. But I was dismayed by the vision and did not understand it. To revise standard version. Okay, so we don't have time to go into a lot of technical details, but if we were all fluent in Hebrew, it would be obvious that this there are different words for, for vision used in these. You see, there's several. the word vision is mentioned several times. But there's... He specifically wanted to know about the vision and the one about the 2300 days and understand it. And those technical words for vision and understanding there that are highlighted in verse 27 are picked up again in Daniel 9.23. And Gordon, I think you can tell us something about that. Also from the New Revised Standard Version. At the beginning of your supplications, a word went out, and I have come to declare it, for you are greatly beloved. So consider the, wor- consider the word and understand the vision. Okay, so there specifically says, and he's talking about that particular one. So if you look through the Daniel 8 and 9 carefully, you realize that every part of the Daniel 8 prophecy was explained until you got to this 2300 days <clears throat> and the 70 weeks. That's the vision and so forth that he didn't understand. So now, he, now Gabriel says, I come back again. He was the one who was there in Daniel 8. Now he comes back again. He says, I want you to understand. Go ahead, Gordon. From the adult uh, teacher's Bible study, from the adult Bible study guide, pardon me. There are many reasons a 70-week prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 to 27, and the 2300 evenings and mornings prophecy of Daniel 8, 14 belong together. Number one, both are time prophecies. Number two, the specific terminology of vision and understanding links them. Number three, both interpretations of the prophecies were given by Daniel. No, Gabriel. Gabriel. Pardon me, by Gabriel. Number four, the only part of the vision not explained in Daniel 8 was the vision about the 2300 evenings and mornings, sometimes translated as days, in Daniel 8, 14. Number five, Daniel 8 complains of vision and then a partial interpretation of it, while Daniel 9 has an interpretation only. In this case, the interpretation of the only part of Daniel 8 not interpreted, which was the 2300-day prophecy of Daniel 8.14, the one part of the vision that Daniel had not understood. Okay. So, by carefully comparing these passages from Daniel, we discovered that, and here we have a little chart sort of set out here, The 70-week prophecy goes from 457 B.C. to A.D. 34. And some of you are going to notice that that looks like it should be 491 years, not 490 years. And the reason is because back in those ancient times, they used numbering systems in which there was no zero. So there was no zero year. There was B.C. 1, and then there's A.D. 1. So... That's why you go. You actually go what we look like, 491 years, which is really only 490 years. Any questions? But actually, weren't all those years, the BCs and ADs, weren't those? Are added those are all added after. later. Yeah. But there, if you we were, if we were really into all the stuff, we would be able to go back and look at all those systems, and we would we would have that same yeah. question, same problem. Then the 2300 days, we now have a piece cut off from the beginning of that 2300 days, the 490 years, from the 457 to AD 34 again. And what's left over if you subtract 490 from 2300? 1810. 1810, and that takes us from AD 34 to AD 34, not 1844. It might have, 18, 1834 might have sounded like that, to 1844. So, um, why do you suppose many of our Christian friends don't want to make that interpretation? Because they don't like where it goes. Yeah. And they don't like the uh, idea of judgment. Yes, exactly. So why do you cho- why do you think God chose to link these two prophecies? He didn't have to 
I mean, the 70-year prophecy, I mean, the 70-week prophecy could have been over here sometime, and the 2200-day prophecy, even if you wanted to give both of them, he didn't have to put them together. Well, the 70 weeks, uh, we, we can see that that is fulfilled in Jesus. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, something very concrete uh, to whereas nail or to nail it down, whereas the twenty three hundred years we say something happened in heaven. Well, how do you prove yeah. that? You know, yeah, it's not as concrete for well, us here on earth. Yeah, even the shepherds in the fields of Bethlehem had a pretty good idea that the seventy week prophecy was coming to an end, and that it was time for the Messiah to come. And I probably should have put it in here, but I'll just tell you about it right now. Ellen White has a startling statement about those shepherds in the fields out there. She says that the angels came down to that choir and they went straight to Jerusalem. They said, surely there must be a lot of people in Jerusalem praying for the coming of the Messiah. It's time. They're, they're ready. And so we'll go down and we'll announce it to them. And they looked and there was nobody looking, nobody praying, nobody paying attention, nobody you know, specifically looking for the coming of the Messiah. They were ready to go back to heaven and someone says, oh, there's some shepherds over here that are watching their sheep. But they're So that's why the angels went over there and sang to them instead of singing in Jerusalem. Hmm. Amazing. Where is that at? I should have put it in here. I'll, oh, I'd like to know that. Yeah, that's a very I interesting never, quote. I never see that. Yeah. Is that in Desire of Ages or is that in... Uh, I think it's in Spirit of Prophecy, yeah, one of the volumes of Spirit of Prophecy. But they, they probably also were the <coughs> the keepers of the temple flock, yeah, which was kept near Bethlehem. Yeah, well, the, the, and the kings, well, the kings wouldn't be there in those days. But so, if those humble shepherds were probably who were probably uneducated in their system of those days, had a pretty good idea about the timing of the prophecies. Shouldn't we be able to get them right? Myra? The time of Christ's coming, his anointing by the Holy Spirit, his death and the giving of the gospel to the Gentiles was definitely pointed out. It was the privilege of the Jewish people to understand these prophecies and to recognize their fulfillment in the mission of Jesus. Christ urged upon his disciples the importance of prophetic study referring to the prophecy given by Daniel in regard to their time. He said, Whoso readeth, let him understand, Matthew twenty four fifteen. After his resurrection, he explained to the disciples and all, all the prophets the things concerning himself, Luke twenty four twenty seven. The Savior had spoken through all the prophets. The Spirit of Christ, which was in them, testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that we shall fo we should follow 1 Peter 1 11 that's from Desire of Ages and so we know that that prophecy predicted the coming of the Messiah meaning the time of the anointing that would be AD 27 when Christ began his public ministry it predicts the time when the gospel would be taken to the Gentiles after the stoning of Stephen and as described in Acts 7 and 8. That would be AD 34. And then in the middle of that time, AD 31, what happens? Messiah cut off. The Messiah is cut off as it describes in Daniel 7. That would be the crucifixion. So even if we had no information about how to date the 457, we should be able to put those dates together and count back to the 457 and it would fit. So it's amazing that the thing I like about this is that if you look at all these prophecies and if you turn around and you go through the book of Acts, there are just little things here and there. And it's been amazing. I, I've traveled to Greece several times and there it is, carved in stone, hints about things that prove a certain date, a certain person was a certain time. And Paul, there, there he was, said, yes, this person was this here and that person was there and so forth. And you could... this whole calendar fits exactly and Adventists are the only ones who make a big deal out of all those dates that fit exactly because we're big into dates mm -hmm. right, we're part of the historical 
uh, interpretation of scripture as opposed exactly. to uh, futurists or I forget what the other one is, the past. Preterists. Preterists, yeah. yeah. I can tell you that some of the commentaries written by other groups, they come to these details in the book of Daniel, for example, and they basically turn them into fairy tales. Just Re- crazy. Revelation, too, when you read Yeah, yeah. just crazy notions. Even William well, Barclay. Yeah, I've, I've been reading uh, through Revelation and I've been looking at what Barclay wrote. He has no idea of the great controversy. It's all about what happened right there in John's day. It's, it's, he just doesn't have a clue. It's sad. Yeah. Well, in Isaiah chapters 40 through 55, which is some people call second Isaiah, God makes it very clear that one of his distinguishing features is his ability to predict future events far in advance. We now have the proof. What does it mean when we say God's election? Now let's talk about God's call again and going on to a second part of this lesson. Has God chosen you for a specific position or task? Jim? Romans 8, 28 to 30. We know that in all things God works for good with those who love him, those who, those whom he has called according to his purpose. Those whom God had already chosen, he also set apart to become like his son, so that the son would be the eldest brother in a large family. And so those whom God set apart, he called, and those he called, he put right with himself, and he shared his glory with them. Good news, Bible. Okay. Has it seemed to be true in your life that in all things God works for good? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and I'm sorry to say this, but the wording of Romans eight twenty eight in the King James Version is not correct. In the original Greek, it does not say all things work together for good, as if there's some fate involved here. Instead, the Greek says, in all things God works for good. So, a little, little change. The word God is actually earlier in the sentence in the, in the earliest manuscripts. So is it clear in your mind from Romans 8.29 that God intends for each of us to be conformed to the image of his Son? Yes. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. It's interesting, if you look at that and you read through it, it just sounds like God has called everybody and he, tra- he justifies everybody and he sanctifies everybody and he glorifies oh hold on a minute he doesn't glorify everybody then I have to go back well if he doesn't glorify everybody he must not sanctify everybody and he must not justify everybody where's the and of course what comes in there is our free will yeah our freedom yeah yeah so uh, do we all manage to do what God wants us to do of course not but that was God's plan for us more than that God has wonderful plans for those who cooperate with him he wants to glorify them. I mean, how could you knock that? In Romans 9 to 11, Paul took on a major challenge, talking about election now, that he must have struggled with mentally for some time. That challenge was to, un- was to understand exactly how God planned to relate to Paul's fellow countrymen, the Jews. And see especially Romans 9, 11 to 13, which I will read right now. But in order that the choice of one son, talking about Abraham's sons and their descendants, uh, one son might be completely a result of God's own purpose, God said to her, the elder will serve the younger. He said this before they were born, before they had done anything either good or bad, so God's choice was based on his call and not on anything they had done. As the scripture says, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau. Bang. Finished, done, cut and dried before they're born, right? Mm-hmm. That sound right to you? Well, at some point they manifested their true yeah. characters. God did. But if God just deal elected with both them, of them before they were born, they didn't have any choice, did they? They did. They did. They okay. Did have choice, so okay. So did. let's look at this now. If you read these verses and do not understand anything about the historical background that Paul was referring to. It can be seriously misinterpreted. God had promised Abraham that his descendants would be the ancestors of the Messiah. 
He also promised him that his descendants would possess the land of Canaan. But who was going to do that? We know that Abraham had one son with Hagar, one son with Sarah, and six more sons with Keturah, whom he married after Sarah's death. He now has eight sons. Genesis 5, 25, 1 and 2. Were all those sons to be the heirs of the promise? We know that's not true. God had specifically chosen Isaac and then later Jacob to be the ones who would be the ancestors of Jesus. Well, so, why were they chosen? Does that suggest that, um, that God arbitrarily chooses someone and that they have no choice in the matter? We know that's not true. Paul went on to say that even in the Old Testament, God specifically said that he would work not only with the Jewish people, but also Gentiles. Romans, see Romans 9, 22 and 20 to 33. But look at these verses, Hosea 2, 23. I will establish my people in the land and make them prosper. I will show love to those who are called unloved and to those who are called not my people. I will say you are my people and they will answer, you are our God. So who are the people who are called not my people? Gentiles. Gentiles. Yeah. Yeah. Look at Hosea 1.10. The people of Israel will become like the sand of the sea more than can be counted and measured. And now God says to them, you are not my people, but the day is coming when he will say to them, you are the children of the living God. Wow. Okay. And finally, Isaiah 10.22 and 23. Even though now there are as many people of Israel as there are grains of sand by the sea, only a few of them will come back. Destruction is in store for the people and it is fully deserved. Yes, throughout the whole country, the Sovereign Lord Almighty will bring destruction as he said he would. And that, of course, talking about what happened to the Jewish people, not nearly all of them will be saved. But it's also, if we had time, we could look at a bunch of other verses that say clearly that Gentiles will be saved. So God had chosen Abraham and his descendants to be the lights to the world. What was God's original plan for them? They were to set up a camp at the crossroads of the world and, and convert the whole world. Their, their message was supposed to spread out. They were supposed to carry the gospel to every part of the world. Well, but they failed to do the task for which God had chosen them. So, when Paul quoted Malachi 1, 2, and 3, when was Malachi written? 400 B.C. Yeah. Way, 400, a little over 400 B.C., so way down after Ezra, after Nehemiah, at the very end of the Old Testament period. He quotes it in nine, Romans 9, 13, saying, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau. Those words are spoken many, many years later long after Jacob and Esau were dead and the various, various, very different choices made by Jacob's descendants and versus Esau's descendants were already apparent. Esau's descendants had pretty much been wiped out by that time. So, Paul assumes that you know this history so that you know when he says, I love Jacob, I hated Esau, that, that's a statement made clear hundreds and hundreds of years later after that history is all done. And, Thus by, it should, and, and by hating Esau, yeah. it means I loved him less. Yes, yeah. Just like Jacob loved Rachel but hated Leah. Well, he didn't really hate Leah. He had a lot of children with her. But, uh, you know, it, he loved her less. Yeah, thank you. She got to be buried with him, whereas Rachel mm -hmm. was buried along the way. Yep. Thus it should be apparent to all of us that God has at least two different ways of choosing or of electing. One, God chooses every one of us to be saved. We, of course, can defeat God's choice by our own decisions or choices. Two, God chooses different people for specific tasks. Consider once again the story of Ezra and Nehemiah. And if we come over to the New Testament, we talk about different people who have different gifts. Isn't that a kind of choosing? God says, I make some apostles and some prophets and some on and on and on. Those, you can read uh, um, Ephesians 4 and 1 Corinthians 12 and places like that. Well, how does it make you feel to know that you were specifically chosen for salvation? One of the things I was thinking about is we don't have any choice of where we were born, really. 
No. I mean, a child is born, it's like, wherever. Well, we were pretty blessed to be born in the part of the world that we're born in because it seems like it has greater light than yeah. many other places. So when you think about us chosen for salvation, I have to be grateful and thankful of where I was born in the geographical sphere yeah. we live on. Yeah. Well, God's choice or his election will never remove your free choice. Unfortunately, most of the world's population have rejected God's election for them to be saved. Think of the story of King Saul. The people had asked Samuel to give them a king. Recognizing how disastrous that would be, God nevertheless chose for them a king of the kind they wanted. So, was, kind, was it the kind God wanted or was it the kind they wanted? They wanted. It was the kind that they wanted. They, it was, Saul was never God's first choice. And we know what the results were. Later, God chose the kind of person he wanted, and we know the story of David, who wasn't a perfect saint, but a whole lot better person than Saul. It really didn't turn out very well for David's line either, did it? No. Hey, well, and of course... Or you and David himself. If you remember the great controversy, what do you think is going to happen? If, if, if the, Satan knows that a particular person and his descendants are going to be chosen to be God's special, you know, the Messiah is coming to them. What's Satan going to do? Work there. He's demand going to that, work there. Demand that you be sifted by wheat, uh, like Absolutely. wheat. Absolutely. And Jesus prayed for Peter. And think about Moses and his heritage, Exodus 3 and 4 and even back to Exodus 1. Moses had been educated to be a leader. In fact, a pharaoh of Egypt. And we know that he went out and, and led sometimes armies to, into battle and was very successful as a general. But then he felt that his life was threatened after he had killed a man for abusing an Israelite. He fled to Midian. After spending 40 years herding sheep, he was certain that there was no future for him back in Egypt. Seemed pretty reasonable, didn't it? <laughs> he did. <laughs> Besides that, he's 80 years old. Yeah, but he was so wrong. His arrest warrant was still in, still in, uh, hadn't expired, huh? No. Moses' life be really began at age 80. That's an encourage for the, encouragement for those of us Amen. with the gray hairs. But Moses was a reluctant recipient of God's call. He tried to back out of it. He tried to claim he was not qualified, and you know the story. However, God kept after him. He knew what he was looking for. He did what God finally until he did what God asked him to do. What a glorious end to Moses' life. And I always chuckle when I think about that because Moses desperately wanted to go in and see the, the, the land of Canaan. And what happened? He went to a better land. <laughs> yeah. Well he got he, he got to, he went up on the on the mountain there and he God showed him the land of Canaan much better than it was real, but what what it could have been and he saw that, and then, of course, he went to the better Canaan. Man, what a, what a wonderful choice. Well, do you think you have been called to do something special for God? Is it possible that you refuse to do it? Think of other people in the Bible who have had specific calls from God, and in some cases have tried to get out of them. Think about the classic story of Jonah. Wow. He just he did just about everything he could he could to avoid doing what God asked him to do. And think about the call of Paul. Would you have chosen the most vigorous killer of God's people to be your greatest evangelist? And I think about that call to him and what did Paul say? Oh no, what did God say to Paul? I've chosen you to be an ambassador to kings and to Gentiles to carry the gospel to kings and Gentiles, something like that. And, I, you know... Paul had Paul. tenacity. <laughs> yeah, he I did. He had tenacity, and it was redirected. But yeah. isn't it every mother's pl privilege to love her children, mm -hmm. to love her husband, and to mm -hmm. care for them? And many of us, we are called to do something from God himself. Mm -hmm. He's He's told us. What we, and it's a pleasure to do it yeah. when he gives us the strength to do it. Yeah. But it may not be some great 
hopefully isn't some <laughs> the <laughs> belly of the well or the you know yeah I w I've always wondered and I, this is one of the things I want to ask the good Lord and maybe Jonah will tell us himself was there some evidence of his having been in that I mean when they looked the people looked at him and did was there something changed in his body of skin or his hair or oh, something from, you. well but oh. I mean yeah I'm sure, but he, uh, he didn't go directly from the whale to Nineveh, so no, he got, he, I'm uh, sure he got cleaned up. He got barfed out on the beach, maybe yeah. he went swimming. <laughs> went back into the water to clean yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyway, so there were some other people who had some strange effects, uh, didn't turn out the way God wanted. Uh, Carrie, I think you have something about that. Yes. The question is, and what about Judas? The history of Judas presents the sad ending of a life that might have been honored of God. Had Judas died before his last journey to Jerusalem, he would have been regarded as a man worthy of a place amongst the twelve, and one who would be greatly missed. And that comes from Desire of Ages, page 716, paragraph 1. Okay, well it's time for us to come to sort of an end of our discussion here. I'd like you out there to think... Do, is it clear in your mind how Daniel eight thirteen and fourteen and twenty Daniel nine twenty four to twenty seven and Ezra seven seventeen and eighteen fit together to make this package that nails down these dates that takes us all the way to eighteen forty four? Is that clear in your mind? Do you understand the seventy weeks and the twenty three hundred day prophecy? Has a time come for us as Seventh-day Adventist Christians to review the work of William Miller? I don't know if you remember, but the story of William Miller was he was a he was a military man. He was a farmer. He was not a pastor. But he decided one time he was going to open his Bible and he had a concordance there, a fairly primitive concordance. And he said, okay, I'm going to go verse by verse and I'm not going to go to the next verse until I'm sure I understand that verse. And it wasn't until he got Daniel down to Daniel 8.14 that he got he thought he was stumped and then he read Daniel 9 and he said hmm I wonder if these fit together and you know the rest of the story well think about the following characters important biblical characters and the specific jobs that God called them to do think about Noah commissioned to serve God before the flood and think build about Abraham what? build a boat build a boat think about Abraham called out by to be the father of God's people. Moses, wow. He leads God's people during the exodus to the borders of the promised land. Joshua, he brings or ushers God's people into the promised land. Samuel, judges during the beginning of the monarchical, uh, mon monarchical period. Hosea and Amos, this, we're just picking out a few, prophesy before the fall of the northern kingdom in Samaria in 722 B.C. Ezekiel and Daniel enter their prophetic ministry during the Babylonian exile. Haggai and Zechariah serve after the return from the exile. And it, was, it was a result of their prophesying and <coughs> really during the people up at the temple got completed. Um, Ezra and Nehemiah, we've been talking about, commenced serving God at the beginning of the 2300-day year prophecy in 457 B.C., John the Baptist calls Israel to repentance prior to the onset of Jesus' ministry. And I keep asking myself today, if someone went out in the wilderness somewhere, out in the Mojave Desert from here, and started preaching a powerful message about the kingdom of God, how many people would pay any attention? And then there was Stephen, witness, who witnessed after which the witnesses after which the gospel went to the Gentiles at the time in which the 70 week prophecy ends in AD 34. And finally, Ellen White, called at the end of the 2300 day year prophecy. Well, other prophets were called in very unusual and sometimes startling ways um, to, to work for God. Consider the experience of Isaiah. Dennis, do you have that? Isaiah 6, 7 to 8. <clears throat> He touched my lips with the burning coal and said, This has touched your lips, and now your guilt is gone, and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord say, Whom shall I send? Who will be our messenger? I answered, I will go. 
send me good news Bible. Do you think uh, Isaiah had any choice? <laughs> here he is standing here and all of a sudden standing in front of the temple and all of a sudden he, he in, in vision he sees the temple open up he looks into the most holy place you know he's not supposed to he's a member of the king's family he's from the tribe of Judah he's not a priest and he looks into that place and so forth and he says whoa 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 and God says we need somebody to carry this message what he was was he still half dazed when he said I will go send me yeah <laughs> I just wonder about that well think of the pro- challenges that Ezra faced as he tried to reorient the people of Israel uh, on the return from the Babylon, Babylon to Persia. They had lived all their lives surrounded by various forms of idolatry, but somehow Ezra and Nehemiah and those who followed them convinced the children of Israel that at least the open forms of idolatry were never to be practiced by them again. We will learn in later lessons about some fairly harsh ways that Ezra and Nehemiah had to deal with the challenging situations among the people. They recognized that in order to survive, the children of Israel must have an unreserved commitment to the true God. As we know, 13 years after Ezra arrived back in Jerusalem, Nehemiah arrived. Nehemiah was a man of action, and since Ezra prepared, uh, had prepared the way, the people were prepared to act. The results were marvelous. In 52 days, the wall was completed. Before leaving this lesson, we should review how predestination has been interpreted in various different ways, and we're going to have to do that real quickly. Um, in fact, I don't think we're going to be able to finish that. Um, we're running out of time. There are three kinds of predestination. There's one way, which is predestination for salvation. We'll just mention them very quickly. And there's a predestination some people have for being called to a particular mission. And then there's a ultimate predestination for all of us God wants all of us to be called to be saved in his kingdom Amen. so th- those are the those are the predestinations if you want to call them that uh, that God has determined um, and he, there's clearly God has made that very very clear considering what we know about the prophets that we have studied in this lesson does Alan White belong to that list Amen. I'll let you think about that as we conclude our lesson our kind and loving Father. What a marvelous revelation we have seen through these studies and through this lesson. How you have set out for us, those of us who are careful enough to investigate, to find out the true correct dates and the correct timing of things and realize here's this enormous period of time spread out before us and and in advance you, you, you spelled it out for us. And we can trace it down and know that that date, 1844, means it was something very important. Even though we didn't see any major event happen here on this earth, something very important began in heaven, and we'll study more about that as we move on. Thank you once again for these revelations. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.